This episode is brought to you by Raycon Wireless Earbuds. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and this week on Mythology Explained, we're talking more Norse mythology. Last time we covered a whole bunch of stuff from the creation of our realm to the creation of the world to the creation of humans. Okay, so I guess we just talked about creation, but this week I'm gonna spill the mead on what I find to be one of the most fascinating parts of the Norse mythos, Yggdrasil, the world tree. Now, if you just heard that and are thinking, really, it's a mythology where the gods are bloodthirsty Viking warriors and you think a tree is is fascinating, I don't blame you, but I do ask that you hear me out. Because this is not like the tree in your backyard or even the one that lunch ladies used to hang me from while poking me with sticks. This is the tree that resides at the center of the cosmos and connects to each of the nine realms. Not only that, there's a plethora of terrifying creatures that live on, around, and underneath Yggdrasil and the Allfather himself, Odin, was hung from its branches. In other words, it's a pretty damn important tree and definitely something the Norse gods would want you to know about. Before we get into all that, though, I want you to know about another tree, the one that's featured on the brand new Solo Fam holiday sweater and long sleeve tee that you can get right now on crowdmade.com. Link below. I had this design whipped up a few weeks ago and I am hyped to finally share it with you. We got a red plastic cup for a tree and Gunther claws looking all cute. Come on, what's not the love? Not to mention we have all these great colors available so you can pick the ones that really bring out your eyes. Though honestly, Gunther's are probably gonna stand out the most. Each order takes about a week to arrive and I'm patiently waiting for mine to get here. So be sure to order yours ASAP so you can join me in repping the solo fam all winter long. But now that the shameless self promo is out of the way, it's time for us to jump into some Norse mythology. As always, I've got to ask the solo fan to do what you do best and punch that like button right in the face hole and subscribe to have more mythological content delivered to your sub box on a regular basis. And now, without further ado, the messed up mythology of Yggdrasil. Now, like most things in mythology, this topic can get very complicated very quickly, so let's start with the very basics and then work our way up. As I mentioned earlier, there is a total of nine different realms within the Norse universe, and each of them is connected to Yggdrasil. Interestingly, none of the sources we have for Norse mythology actually list these worlds outright like they do with the gods and even the gods' horses, so experts have had to piece them together from various poems, songs, and stories. The truth is, the names of these worlds, along with how you describe them, were probably different based on the time period and what country you were in, but these nine names were the ones experts believed to be the most common. Another weird little detail about these worlds is that none of the texts are clear about how exactly Yggdrasil connects to them. We do know that a few are attached to its roots, something that we'll touch on a bit more later, but the other six could be anywhere from supported within its branches to wrapped around its trunk. You can imagine it however you want, but what's important is that Yggdrasil is the nucleus of the realms, and for this reason, the gods consider it to be the holiest of holy places. In fact, they meet at the tree every single day to discuss their godly business and decide what issues in the universe need to be taken care of. But it's important to note that there are other beings who don't just visit the tree, they live there full time. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this cast of characters is pretty damn hilarious. For example, there's four stags who live in the tree's branches and just jump around eating its leaves, and no one knows what they're supposed to represent. Some suggest they embody the four seasons, and others say the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, Water, but that's all conjecture. Then there's the nameless wise eagle who lives at the top of the tree and for some reason has a hawk named Vedfolner living between his eyes. This is so hilarious and weird to me. I really want to know why the hawk decided the best real estate in all the cosmos was between a giant eagle's eyeballs. There are experts who've theorized about it and a very simple explanation is that Vedfolner may have been referred to as both a hawk and an eagle by different sects of Norse worshippers and Snorri Sturluson, the author, was trying to appease them both by including both. But another theory is that Vedfolner's associated with the eagle's wisdom, like Odin's ravens are with his, and that maybe he's responsible for going out and getting information for the eagle, and I kind of like that idea. After all, the eagle's got to keep an eye out for Nidhogg, the giant dragon that chews at the roots of the tree. According to Odin, there's more serpents living under the tree than anyone can count, but Nidhogg is the biggest and baddest. And then you have my favorite resident, Ratatoskr the squirrel. All this dude does is carry insults back and 
forth between Nidhogg and the eagle who lives at the top of the tree. The best part is he makes up half the insults himself. Homie lives for the drama. Also, for some reason, I can't help but picture him as the squirrel who hates Jake from Adventure Time. And now that I think about it, that might have something to do with him being my favorite resident. Now that we've covered everything above ground, though, let's talk about the roots of Yggdrasil. There are three major ones that support the tree and extend far off into other locations. Those locations vary depending on the source, but the ones I found to be the most common were Asgard, Jotunheim, and Hell, with Niflheim sometimes substituting for Hell. But there's more to the roots than just where they go. We also have to discuss what's under them. Like Nidhogg, for example. He and all those other serpents live in a spring called Virgilmir, roughly translated to bubbling, boiling spring, that's under the root connected to Niflheim. Then you have the well of the wise being Mimir that's under the root connected to Jotunheim. According to the prose Edda, the well contains wisdom and intelligence, and Odin himself sacrificed one of his eyes to Mimir so he could take a drink. And last but not least, under the root that reaches the heavens is the well of Urd, where the Norse equivalents of the fates, called Norns, live. Their names are Urd, Verandi, and Skuld, and they shape the destinies of men. They're also responsible for using the water from their well to repair the damage done to Yggdrasil by all of its residents. The Norns even share the well with two swans that happen to be the parents of the entire swan race. So if you were wondering where the ugly duckling really came from, now you know. But hey, now that we're on the subject, I actually want to tell you about a brutal myth involving the Norns in Odin's never-ending quest for wisdom. So we've already established that Odin is a relentless pursuer of knowledge. There's a reason he was willing to spoon an eye out of his own head to gain wisdom. But if you just so happen to be a masochist who doesn't think that's much of a sacrifice, I've got a myth for you that perfectly portrays the lengths that Odin is willing to go to for the sake of knowledge. So like I said last section, the Norse fates, the Norns, live by the Well of Urd, which has a number of incredible properties. Not only can the water from it be used to heal the world tree, it's from this well that the Norns learn the techniques they use to shape the fate of all living things. And one way that they go about doing this is carving runes into Yggdrasil's trunk, which carries their intentions throughout the entire tree and affecting everything in the Nine Realms. Now, for those unaware, runes are like the Norse equivalent of letters, but also so much more than that. In addition to being a symbol that represented the noises people made with their mouths, each rune symbolized a cosmological principle or power. Therefore, to carve a rune in something meant to invoke and direct the force it stood for. For example, if you were going on a journey out to sea, you might carve runes representing calm waters in the side of your boat. Or if you were going into battle, you may carve runes for strength and fortitude in the handle of your axe. To put it another way, runes allowed people to access, interact with, and influence the world-shaping forces they symbolized. However, before we knew about runes, they were a secret of the Norns, and Odin was not just going to accept that there was an entire system of magic out there that he couldn't use. The problem was the runes wouldn't just reveal themselves to anyone. To see them, one had to prove themselves worthy. So Odin did the unthinkable, in an act that he describes as sacrificing himself to himself, he hung himself from Yggdrasil's branches, stabbed himself with a spear, and stared downward into the waters of Urd's well. The other gods were under strict orders to not give him any relief, no food, and not even a sip of water. And the Allfather hung there in a delicate balance between life and death for nine days and nine nights. At the end of the ninth night is when the runes finally revealed themselves to him, and Odin Odin let out a triumphant scream that shook the tree to its roots. And what did Odin's sacrifice yield him? He now knew chants that could heal emotional and bodily wounds. He could bind his enemies and render their weapons useless. He could free himself from any kind of binding and put out fires in an instant. He knew spells that would expose and banish users of evil magic, that would protect his loved ones in battle, and even raise the dead. It's said that he even learned a spell that could win and keep any lover. Now Odin was one of the most knowledgeable and powerful beings in the the entire cosmos, and he would not have it any other way. And you know what I really love about this story? The idea of Odin sacrificing himself to himself with the intention of improving himself. We've talked about this concept of self-sacrifice a lot over the years in a range of stories from Heracles to Pinocchio, but there's something about how straightforward and brutal this one is that makes me have a special appreciation for it. Odin knew that he had to give up what he currently was for what he would become. 
basically killing the current conception of himself. Because attaining wisdom always comes at a cost, and he had to prove that he was both willing and able to pay it. By the way, this myth might actually be how Yggdrasil got its name. You see, Yggdrasil is one of the many names that Odin went by, and Drasil means horse. But because gallows were sometimes referred to as the horses of the hanged, some experts believe that Yggdrasil really means Odin's gallows. Pretty dope, huh? But listen, while Odin may have been willing to sacrifice his life for greater knowledge, do you know what price he didn't want to pay? Too much for wireless earbuds, so he was ecstatic when he found out about this week's sponsor, Raycon. So if you've watched our show for a while, then you should already be familiar with Raycon, but for the newbies, you're gonna want to hear this, pun absolutely intended. Raycon is a company founded by Ray J that produces high quality wireless earbuds that are affordable and accessible for everyone. Not only do their newest models, the Everyday E25, start at half the price of other premium earbuds on the market, they sound just as great and are far more versatile. I used to have other wireless earbuds that I was paranoid about falling out of my ears and losing forever and that always seemed to run out of battery whenever I needed them most, but with the E25s, those worries are non-existent. First off, they have a compact, noise-isolating fit that holds them in place and drowns out all the noise I don't want to hear, like the absolute trash that my gym insists on playing over the speakers to take me out of the zone. Also, their charging case can store four entire charges, giving me 24 hours of playtime to listen to music, audiobooks, or podcasts. I should also mention that they come in a ton of cool colors so you can pick out which ones match your style best or even get multiple pairs to coordinate with your daily fits. But if all those features and them being half the price of other premium brands somehow isn't enough for you, you'll be happy to hear that for a limited time, if you go to buyraycon.com solo, you'll get an extra 20% off. Trust me when I say if you've been considering investing in some wireless earbuds, either for yourself or as a gift this holiday season, now is the time to check out Raycons for the best prices of the year. Again, just go to buyraycon.com slash solo to get an extra 20% off your purchase for a limited time. Okay, that was either my best or worst transition to a sponsor of all time. But now it's time to wrap this up, Solo fams. Make sure you drop a like and subscribe before you go and comment your thoughts about what we talked about today. Would you be willing to sacrifice an eye and hang yourself from a tree for nine days to gain infinite knowledge about the universe? I'm genuinely curious. Also, make sure you follow me on social media. That's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news and what videos are coming up next. Not to mention, it's a pretty good way of being notified when I upload since YouTube system just refused to do the one thing it was made to do. Then when you're through with all that, consider following this little goofbag because he loves you and wants to share his life with you. I'll be seeing you guys again later this week with yet another episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.